Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this joint aesthetic medicine and professional beauty webinar. Um, I'm Georgia, I'm editor of Aesthetic Medicine magazine, and I am joined by John Exley. Hi, there. Um, hi John, thank you for joining us. Um, so John is Honorary Secretary of the British Medical Laser Association um, and he's also Managing Director of Linton Lasers um, but he's here with kind of more of his BMLA hat on today to talk to us all about laser plume um, and managing that now that we are all thank God be uh, able or you you guys all thank God able to um, to open up clinic again um, and start performing your laser treatments um, on the body, hopefully on the face soon. Um, but yeah, to, to just talking about how to manage laser plume in this kind of new, um, new COVID world, um, and along with all the new health and safety kind of guidelines that everyone needs to be adhering to. So I think we will probably have a few more people joining. Um, but what we'll do, so John has a presentation um, that he's gonna talk through. So he'll start screen sharing in a minute. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you just want to pop them in the uh, chat box, I will turn my camera off and I will come back on at the end um, and I will pass your questions on to John and we'll have a bit of a Q&A session. So if there's anything, please feel free to ask. Um, and yeah, and we'll get to questions after. So I'm going to turn my camera off if you're ready to go with the presentation, John. Yeah, all good. Um, and then, yeah, we can just, we can just chat through. Um, Okay, cool. See that okay? Yeah, that looks good to me. Really, yeah. Okay, thanks, Georgia. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is John Exley, and um, I guess a bit of background. I, I studied physics, I did laser physics at university and, and uh, a PhD in lasers, uh, and obviously got into this industry. I am the Managing Director now of Linton Lasers, but also the Honorary Secretary of the British Medical Laser Association. And I think, and, you know, chatting today, keep it nice and informal, but um, very informative, I hope, about how we should all proceed with uh, managing the risks that we now face as we reopen our clinics and we undertake laser treatments. I think it's um, something that, as a company, we've worked on uh, incredibly hard over the past few weeks to develop some guidance and of course with the British Medical Laser Association uh, there's been some fantastic work done and um, some clear guidance specifically for laser treatments and managing the risks. So my plan for the next sort of half hour, hour is to just talk through I guess step by step some of the ways in which we can limit risks during uh, laser procedures you know, I'm talking about skin laser procedures. Um, now that we're in a, in a COVID, uh, co uh, post-COVID world. So I'll move on to, uh, I guess, a bit of general risk management. I mean, this week, um, clinics are starting to reopen. We got great news last week that, um, you know, I think everybody who was waiting, some clinics had already opened, but everyone who was sort of waiting got the, uh, clear guidance from government that we could reopen this week. Probably worth noting that, you know, some of the confusion that had lay, you know, whether we could or could not re reopen if we're in aesthetic laser clinics, was that there isn't, there isn't a category, is there, that the government defines as a aesthetic laser clinics. And so if you try to then have a look and discover what sort of steps or guidance you should follow to safely undertake laser treatment, it's not the sort of thing you're going to find on a government website, which is why it's important, I think, to, to do work like today. What you will find on a government website is that this um, risk assessment or this set of sort of guidance that any establishment reopening now needs to follow. So initially, if you've done nothing or you're starting to prepare now and thinking, well, what steps do I need to take? I do advise you that you log on to this uh, web link here. And the government's recommendation is this five-step plan, really, where you should carry out a risk assessment, and that will inform you of any risk that you might have. And 
in a clinic in general, there are, there are areas like waiting areas, you know, toilets, you know, areas outside of the treatment room where social distancing and, and standard sort of pr pr protocols and procedures should be put in place. So one of the best defenses against COVID transmission, of course, is hand washing, you know, just make sure people can clean hands, make sure there's, there's uh, sanitizers, social distancing, you know, keeping well apart. So it's important really to put in all these steps and you've got to do this through a risk assessment. To do a good risk assessment, it, it, it's worth knowing or considering and understanding how COVID would be transmitted. So a lot of COVID transmission comes from uh, obviously close contact with people. So touch or transmission through droplets from the, the respiratory tract. So when we speak and we breathe and we cough and we sneeze, you know, whether we like it or not, microscopic particles are projected from our mouths, which if that's from a COVID positive patient or person, then that's a, a big contamination risk. We can, we can limit some of this risk by staying apart. So if we all stay two meters or now one meter plus away from each other, that's what we call social distancing and that can be very beneficial. But when you get into a treatment room and you start to do hands-on treatments and laser treatments particularly, then obviously social distancing is not possible anymore. And that, that's a problem we are facing clinics. So we get in close contact in the treatment room. And we've got these sorts of risks here that you can see where if someone was to sneeze, cough, even just speak or shout, any of those droplets from a COVID positive patient that would go into our mouths or our eyes could then infect somebody or infect us as, as practitioners. So we have to think about how we minimize those risks. And in fact, every clinic should do a risk assessment. And there's a, um, a risk assessment available if anyone wants, you can download it from the, from actually from the Linton Lasers website. But this risk assessment talks through almost like the patient journey and the client journey through the clinic from entering the, uh, the waiting room all the way through into the treatment room. And it's, it's all common sense and I don't think it's anything you probably haven't thought of already. But I think, well, you have to undertake a risk assessment by law before you, you, you put in place the appropriate procedures before you should be uh, opening your clinics again. Now, once we get into the treatment room, that's where things get trickier with laser treatment. And that's where uh, this document that was published, uh, a lot of hard work done by Dr. Vishal Madan, a consultant dermatologist and the president of the British Medical Laser Association. And he's put together fantastic guidance with input from others um, on the, the real risks and hazards associated with the laser treatment specifically and the risks posed by COVID uh, transmission to those laser treatment. Now, this is freely available to download as well from the British Medical Laser Association's website as well. And this is the, the document really that I want to step through ne next, bit by bit, just to talk through the, the main risks associated with laser treatments. Now, of course, a lot of the risks are to do with uh, a COVID positive patient or client coming into the clinic. So you can start to reduce that risk by doing some sort of pre-treatment screening. And most clinics I'm aware of will be, should be implementing something like this already. It might take the form of a questionnaire or some sort of um, online form that's filled in by people before they arrive at clinic. Because the best defense, of course, against COVID uh, risks is to avoid treating anybody who's COVID positive. So try and screen people out some people are doing temperature checks. Um, we're not doing that ourselves, I, I, um, but I know other clinics have started doing that. The main, the main thing with treatment screening is it's okay if people have got symptoms, but as we know with COVID now, there's a lot of uh, asymptomatic patients. So people who don't show any symptoms may not even realize that they're COVID positive. And so it's those patients, I guess, that can slip through the net and end up in a treatment room. And it's for those, it's, that's the reason we take these extra precautions 
when we're doing laser treatments because we have to assume that you know ideally we're not treating anyone who's COVID positive but if somebody did slip through the net asymptomatic for example then we would um, would obviously be at, at risk there. General hygiene, so obviously patient comes in, hand washing, uh, the advice from the British Medical Laser Association and our advice as well at, at Linton is to, uh, to ask patients to wear face masks, so like surgical masks. Um, and that would be part of a sort of general PPE that someone would wear. But when we get into treatment room and start lasering, there's an additional hazard that occurs that really is unique to the laser sector. And that is the uh, hazard created by laser plume. And that's really what the rest of this document, the British Medical Laser Association guidance talks about. It's how to manage and mitigate the risks associated with laser plume and, and the transmission of COVID through laser plume. And that's done you know, through PPE, ventilation, smoke evacuation, and, and looking after your lasers. And they're, they're the points that we'll talk through uh, step by step now. I thought it might be worth just talking a bit about laser plume first of all. Um, it might be a term people are familiar with, or, or, or maybe not. But I um, thought I'd start just by closing down the screen show here. And I'm going to demonstrate um, just what laser plume looks like and, and what it is. Laser plume is essentially smoke that's created uh, when we laser skin tissue. And it's very much associated with ablative lasers. And I've got a CO2 laser here. And I'm just going to demonstrate on a COVID negative um, pepper. And the pepper is actually a great um, example. When we're teaching people about CO2 treatments, it's a great um, piece of fruit, just a laser, and get the effects of some of the ablative um, techniques that we use. And I want to show you now, I want to use this now to just show exactly what laser plume looks like. So I'm going to put on my laser goggles and check the laser's ready. So this would be um, the sort of, this laser would be the sort of laser used if you were treating um, sort of skin resurfacing or ablative or fractional um, treatments for wrinkles. It's a CO2 laser, it's absorbed by, predominantly by water. And when it's absorbed by water, it creates steam in the skin, that then generates um, particles that fly off from the tissue. And this is what I want you to see now. It will look a little bit like smoke coming off the uh, pepper. Okay, here we go. Okay. And if you can see there, that right, sort of white smoke coming up into the air. Now I can see and I can smell it as well. See that? So that's the sort of thing that happens when we're treating uh, patients with, uh, with ablative lasers, particularly. And so if I jump back onto the slide, and we, I want to really talk about what, what do we know about laser plume already? So, laser plume is usually thought of as the sort of smoke, the debris that comes off uh, skin when we're doing ablative laser treatments, like CO2 or radiant react. Um, and if I'm honest, over the years, many people have um, been fully aware of this and taken precautions for laser plume with uh, ablative lasers. I guess where I think the industry is sort of falling short, and I think the COVID uh, pandemic has, has highlighted this, is laser plumes generated with, with other laser treatments. I mean, hair removal, for example generates significant laser plume. And that, that's particles and little bits of uh, vaporized hair and dust that just blasts off into the atmosphere during treatment. I mean, I'm quite familiar with, um, with practitioners who do a lot of hair removal 
saying how they become accustomed to the smell of burnt hair. In fact, it's a sign that the treatment's working well. Well, of course, if you can smell burning hair, that means part, you're, you're inhaling this laser fluid. So something the BMLA looked at when we were putting together the guidance was, well, what treatments would create laser fluid? And the conclusion was, well, actually, every skin laser treatment has the potential to produce some laser fluid. Even if you're treating vascular lesions with a full style laser, if you were to zap a hair follicle, um, clearly not, you're not aiming for that, but if you were, some sort of debris, some sort of plume will come off the skin. So maybe that's the first point, is that the conclusion has to be that all laser treatments have the potential, at least, to produce some level of laser fluid. Now we also know from previous research that laser plume can contain viable uh, viruses. So HPV, HIV have been found uh, contained within certain laser plumes. So that's, that's been known particularly for treatments of CO2 and early NAC, for example. So you might assume that you know, the heat from the laser might destroy any virus, might kill a virus, but that's not always the case. That's not, not true. There's evidence to show that laser plume can contain viable virus. That's the second ma main point. And we also know that laser plume can carry particles of varying sizes. What you could see on the screen before, I hope you could see at least, was like a smoke effect. Now, if you can see it, their particles of smoke, they're quite large, relatively large. What, what's much, more, much smaller and microscopic um, is uh, much smaller particles, which would be called aerosol. And we know that laser plume contains aerosol. So aerosol is just very, very small particles. I think I, I was speaking to some of them, health and safety executive recently, and I said, um, you know, what's the definition of an aerosol? What size does it have to be? Actually, there's no clear definition was the answer. But there are particles that can enter and travel down very deep into your respiratory system. So right into the, the tiniest, um, the tiniest parts of your lung, uh, if the particle is small enough to reach there, it's an it's aerosol. Aerosols also are so small that the particles remain airborne for quite some time. So we know about laser plume. We know we can generate it with potentially any laser treatment. All right, some of that might be quite small amounts, but nevertheless, it can be generated. We know that some laser plumes can carry viable virus. And we know that laser plume carries uh, particles of different sizes, including aerosol. And when we link that then to COVID, we also know that COVID is carried in aerosol, or believed to be carried mainly in aerosol. And we know that COVID is a, is a virus, and it's quite a small virus, it's the size of it. So the BMLA's conclusion has to be that whilst we don't know for certain that skin cells would carry COVID virus, that there is a chance or a risk that skin could be contaminated. And therefore, if we laser it, we create an airborne contaminated, uh, COVID contaminated plume. And that's a big risk that we have to factor into the BMA guidance. And we have to manage that risk, okay? So, the main way out to manage that risk, of course, is with PPE or personal protective equipment. And that's the, the focus, I think, of, of a lot of what has been discussed in, in the media as we open up our clinics, um, is whether or not, you know, what sort of PPE should we be using for different treatments. Okay, so in the BMLA guidance, it goes through quite nicely a sequence of uh, different levels of protection we should wear. PPE is always used when uh, social distancing falls down. So we're in the treatment room, we're close together, we um, are lasering away. There's a potential contamination now with the smoke that's produced from the laser treatment, whether that be hair removal, vascular lesions, or, or obviously with uh, 
more ablative treatments. So the BMLA's recommendation is we implement standard PPE that I think most people would consider wearing just because you're close to the uh, patient. So face masks, gloves, aprons, uh, visors, caps. These are the, the sorts of PPE we'd wear largely to mitigate against close proximity. So you're now you know, within the two meter zone, probably less than a meter doing treatments. One additional piece of PPE that you have to always wear, of course, with lasers is uh, the appropriate eyewear, the goggles to protect us from the laser itself. So one thing I've been recommending and certainly we've done in, in our clinic is to, um, we've got our practitioners to, to put on the face mask, the goggles, or the PPE, and actually have a go at some treatments because it's, you know, it's a different uh, feeling, sensation. It's, it's not easy to wear all this, this um, protective equipment that you haven't done before and simultaneously do laser treatments. So I think it's well worth just having a practice, putting it all on and just turning on the laser and checking you can, uh, you can function effectively uh, as well as possible with all the kit on. Now that's the sort of uh, equipment you might wear just because you're in a confined space within two meters of a potentially COVID positive patient. But when it comes to the actual plume itself, then the main line of defense for ourselves is the um, surgical masks or, well, the, the um, in fact, they're called respirators. So surgical masks would be something that the patient would wear and that's largely as a defense against uh, them uh, infecting um, us as practitioners. To protect against the plume itself, then it's, uh, the respirators are the main source of defense. And the respirators are simply, I'll just click onto this slide. Th these are respirators. So before all this uh, occurred, I'd have called these masks. And I think that's what most people do, refer to them as. But technically, these are respirators. And the main difference is that a mask, a surgical mask, for example, is designed to protect the patient in theatre from infection from a surgeon. So we put on the mask and it protects uh, the outgoing air is stopped uh, and, and doesn't infect somebody else. For the respirator, respirators are designed to do the opposite. They're designed to stop particles going into your, to your lungs. So they're defense uh, against uh, contamination from the, the outside world. And there's different sorts of respirators and they have different grades. And I'm sure you'll be familiar with this. If it, certainly if you're in lasers, it's been talked about a lot, the difference between FFP2, FFP3. So with respirators, there, there are different classifications and the FFP stands for filtering face piece and that's the European standard, and it's governed under the medical certification process. So with any respirator that you're gonna use for laser treatments, you need to really look for medical CE. There are also um, N values like N95 and N99, or KN95 and KN99, and they are American and Chinese um, standards which are equivalent to the medical CE. So most people at the moment tending to try and use medically approved CE masks or sorry, respirators, because that's what health and safety executive are suggesting is the, the best course of action at the moment. The difference between an FFP2 and an FFP3 is mainly the uh, size of particle or the amount of small particles that these will prevent getting into your lungs. So as you can see here, an FFP2 is designed to prevent about 94% of particles getting into your lungs, whereas FFP2 is 99% effective. Um, some of them have these valves on the front. Not, not all of them will have these valves. If they do have a valve, then usually it implies that when you breathe out, 
uh, you're not actually protecting the uh, client or patient, as in your breath can come out easily, but nothing can come back in. So some people are choosing to have FFP3 masks without the valve on to give a sense of, of protection from yourself to the client. The primary reason to wear a, a respirator like this in a laser treatment is to prevent inhalation of the, the laser plume itself. The BMLA's recommendation is that FFP2 masks should be sufficient for most treatments. But uh, if we're treating above the clavicle or above the neck, so facial treatments, then the BMLA recommends upgrading to FFP3. And there's a couple of reasons for that, really. One is that there's an assumption that if we're treating above the neck, uh, it's going to be a facial treatment, and therefore we're going to have to ask the uh, client to remove their mask. And in doing so, that's an increased risk now for the practitioner of infection from, the, from, from uh, respiratory particles. And there's, a, there's another reason, and that is that the main source of COVID infection that could contaminate skin tissue and therefore be projected into the air is likely to be um, through inadvertently touching or, or contaminating the skin. And so a patient is more likely to, you know, sneeze, cough, a COVID, COVID positive patient and contaminate their skin around their, their mouth, around their face than they are on the rest of their body. So in fact, there's an increased risk of COVID contamination in the skin above the neck. And therefore, the FFP3 masks are advised in place of the FFP2, if possible, to minimize that risk. When I was speaking to Health and Safety about this, um, they have a team of people over there who, who advised us. And in fact, it was, it's quite well put, I thought, that um, we were talking about the difference between the two masks and, and why it really mattered to go to FFP3 if you could. And they said, well, most of these masks were designed really for industrial zones where you get particles uh, of chemicals or, you know, like asbestos, for example, things like that. Things that can be uh, toxic to your body. And the main difference between the two masks really, or, or, or any, uh, any different mask with a different percentage protection, is that, you know, there's some toxic chemicals, for example, that people might work with, that in very small doses, that there is no issue. It's only as you get an increased dose that uh, there's a problem. And so you can get it, you know, an FFP2 mask is, is perfectly fine for those situations. As they pointed out, with a virus, there isn't really um, a level of toxic toxicity. It only takes a small amount of virus to enter your lungs, your respiratory tract, to then potentially infect you with COVID. And that's why if the risk is high, they do recommend trying to use the FFP3 masks. Respirators for you. Now with the respirators, the health and safety executive advise um, fit testing and another misconception I think in our industry is and certainly one that I understood first was that FFP3 masks need fit testing and FFP2 mask uh, respirators sorry were, were, um, were, were okay without fit testing and, and that's not true uh, health and safety executives say any of these disposable respirators sh should have uh, fit, been fit tested but here's guidance that you can get from HSE about just generally how to wear such uh, disposable respirators. I think the first thing is uh, no facial hair. You need to create a really good seal around your face to make sure that uh, the, the dust, the, the laser plume can't go in around the edges. The mask's useless if it's not sealed well to the skin. Uh, all, the, you know, all, all the filtering effects are lost completely if the air can just flow in around the edges. When you're putting on uh, one of these respirators, make sure you wash your hands first. You don't want to contaminate it. And once it's been put on, there'll be straps that go around the, the head and around the neck. They should be pulled nice and tight, but not overly tight. So you should get a nice seal around your face. If you do have a valve on the front of them, just check it's not damaged. 
just before you use it. In fact, check in general that the mask not damaged. They recommend holding it up to the light, seeing if there's any visible holes. Obviously, any, any damage, then don't use it. Um, if you are doing laser treatments, you, you have to be aware you've got to wear laser goggles, of course, to just make sure that the respirator's fitted well and that the goggles aren't interfering or aren't, aren't disrupting the seal that you get. And the big thing now is, uh, at first I was asked, well, how long can you use these disposable respirators for? And a lot of the manufacturers suggest sessional use, and I've seen on Health and Safety Executives' website themselves, um, they can be used, say, up, up to eight hours use. But they recommend that you take a break after one hour's continuous use. So you can carefully remove a respirator, provided you then wash your hands afterwards, and you can reposition it uh, after a short break, again, washing your hands before and after touching and refitting the respirator. Um, the, the main reason that you take a break after an hour that they, they can cause build up condensation on the inside. So prolonged use without breaks can affect the skin. It's not very nice for the skin. But they also find that um, after people have used it for long periods, they become looser. And so you lose the seal effect. So the recommendation is one hour's continuous use with respirators. Okay, done the treatment, you know, we've created some plume in the room and we um, protected ourselves with our PPE, but we need to vent the room. So the BMLA's recommendation is to try and use whatever methods possible to allow airflow and, and to uh, sort of create ventilation in between treatments. So this can be done mechanically. So there are air filtration units that can be used. Um, and if an air filtration unit's used, as with the smoke evacuator systems that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, we should be using the, the ultra low uh, particulate uh, air filters. So a lot of filters have HEPA filters in them. Um, now HEPA filters typically can uh, filter out small particles but I think that they go down to about 10 microns. And we know that aerosol and uh, COVID, for example, as a, as, a, as a virus, the average size of um, COVID or SARS virus is about 0.1 micron. So you need the ultra low uh, particulate air filters, the uh, ULPA filters, because they have much finer um, essentially meshing them that can filter out the very small particles. So if you're going to use air filtration units or if you're going to use smoke evacuation units to make sure the viral, viral particles are extracted, you need the, the ultra-low uh, filters. Opening windows is clearly a, gr a great thing. We know that once um, the uh, COVID is airborne outside, it's blown all over the place, then obviously the viral load is so small it's it's, it's not very contagious. That's why, um, you know, being outside, keeping windows open, that's the advice from government in, in general. Not, not all treatment rooms obviously have windows, particularly laser treatment rooms may well not have an ability to do that. But if you've got um, air conditioning units, I know some air conditioning systems have an ability to extract air and pump it outside. Obviously that's, uh, just make sure uh, that's the setting that you're using in your air conditioning. And, and then simply leave time between treatments to allow this airborne dust, this, this smoke to, to dissipate uh, or to settle. And, and, and then you need to decontaminate areas. So you must wipe down surfaces between treatments um, with alcohol wipes, for example, and things like the laser equipment itself, of course. It can reduce the effects of plume with other devices as well. And most people who use CO2 lasers probably already uh, have uh, a smoke evacuation system. It's very common with the ablative laser treatments to use a smoke evacuator. And, and the sort of smoke evacuator that should be used uh, now to mitigate the risk of COVID would be something like this. 
um, it would have the ultra low particulate air filter. Uh, th this particular model is used uh, generally in NHS uh, laser surgery and it has, as you can see over here, it has a, a viral filter. This, this big box um, is a, a very low particulate air filter, so this will extract the virus from the air as the air gets sucked through it. Before, that is a pre-filter. So the pre-filter doesn't always need to be used, but that takes out larger smoke particles and essentially protects the viral filter from any um, from being clogged up too quickly by other sorts of contaminants in the air. So the pre-filter is a sort of filter that we use, say, every treatment or every session, and the viral filter would last for 24, 36 hours worth of use in, in treatment. Then you've got the tube itself, and you take that up to the treatment site, and it's very important, uh, something to a guy called Mike Murphy, who's done a lot of work in this area, Smoke evacuators are, are excellent tools, but they're very sensitive to proximity. So you have to get the end of the nozzle very close to the treatment site to ensure you're sucking enough of the smoke away, enough of the plume away. And if you move away very slightly, certainly some of the, the weaker systems very quickly become ineffective. So you need to make sure that, that you, they're used, used effectively. This, with this particular system, because it's mainly used in surgery, all of those elements there, the tube, the pre-filter, and the biofilter, are essentially disposables, uh, so that if they become contaminated, then they can be got rid of. And they just slot into the actual machine itself, which gives this the suction. So smoke evacuation is a very effective method. There's lots of studies uh, been done to show it's a highly effective way of reducing laser plume. And it's, if possible, it really it can make a significant difference to the treatment uh, and the airborne particles. Another way of restricting plume, actually, uh, which um, we're sort of with calling plume prevention mode now at Linton, there are a number of treatment uh, techniques. So with IPL, for example, it's very common People would put a gel on the skin first, and then a light guide, as you can see in this picture, would be pressed onto the gel, and then the light fired into the tissue, and any debris, any particles coming off, essentially get trapped between the, the, end, the, the solid light guide end and the gel itself. So the gel then contains the plume, it traps the plume and stops it getting airborne. There are some pain-free modes, like the motors there, you can see the, the little video, there's gel on the skin, the laser light is being zapped through a uh, sapphire tip, and the sapphire tip with the gel together prevent the launching of particles into the atmosphere of the air. So these can significantly, there's a great paper published that shows that a significant reduction in laser plume in these sorts of methods. But where this isn't possible, that's where some like smoke evacuation is um, you know, with a system like this, is a much more effective measure as well. I think with any laser treatments, um, we talked a lot about the plume itself. There's a high risk of contamination from the plume, but of course, make sure your laser itself is uh, kept in good condition, it's working well. Be familiar with decontaminating your laser. So the other transmission method for COVID is of course just touch. If you were to touch the end of the laser onto some um, contaminated skin, for example, then we have to disinfect the end of the laser before treating someone else. Um, alcohol wipes are perfect for that. I get the highest percentage alcohol possible. I know people talk about uh, above 60 or 70 percent. So for, for, for use on your hands, you know, 60 to 70 percent is acceptable because otherwise your, your hands will significantly suffer, your skin will suffer if you use anything higher. But when you're wiping down equipment, higher al alcohol content is better. So if you can get wipes or um, alcohol wipes with a you know, 70, 80, 90 percent content, that would be a much better option for decontaminating equipment between treatments. 
just, just bear in mind, you know, most laser practitioners, uh, I would imagine, are very familiar with this sort of decontamination. Once you've treated one person, you would always wipe down the end of your laser, any of your light guides with, uh, you know, an alcohol wipe like this. But, but now what we're recommending is more than that, just wipe down the laser itself. We've created some plume in the atmosphere, we've waited uh, 15 minutes or so, and some of that is starting to settle down. You want to wipe down the screen of the laser, wipe down the top of the laser, wipe down the sides as well in, in the treatment area. Um, so just be aware of how you should manage your laser system. Manufacturers can advise you on the best way to essentially decontaminate your laser between treatments. There are some treatments like tattoo removal, for example, where there are additional steps that you could take. Um, I know some years ago, people tried tattoo removal uh, almost through cling film, like a plastic um, film that would be put on the skin and fire a laser through. Uh, so there are ways to reduce tissue uh, splatter or plume from things like tattoo removal, which obviously is a, a high risk treatment with COVID. Um, and again, I think manufacturers uh, can advise people on what's best to do there. So in summary, for me, um, the best thing to do for laser treatments is get hold of the British Medical Laser Association guidance, which will essentially guide you through safe practice for treatment in a post-COVID world. And we start by asking patients to wear masks where possible, uh, where not possible, of course, if you're doing facial treatments, which we hope to be able to do in the future, of course, then they might have to remove the mask. Then we, we manage that risk through our own PPE. And that should be by wearing things like visors, gowns if possible, maybe aprons, gloves of course. Um, but specifically for laser, FFP2 mask treatments on the body or FFP3 mask treatments on the face or neck, so above the clavicle. To help reduce risks again, and reduce plume, smoke evacuation systems can be employed, or, um, or try and vent the room between treatments. And make sure between patients that surfaces are decontaminated so everything's wiped down in between patients. When you follow all these steps, we reduce the risk of COVID transmission considerably. Um, for more information as well, uh, Linton has produced a COVID checklist. This is more general. It talks a bit about laser treatment. It also talks about uh, good practice and procedures just generally throughout the clinic. And it's free to anybody. You don't have to be a Linton customer. I think it's in the interest of our industry that we all act responsibly. And so please log on to our website if you wish to download this for extra guidance. And I guess I've just finished by suggesting to everybody that now is a time where anybody doing laser treatment should come together and an association like the British Medical Laser Association is the perfect body to help with guidance, to talk to government, to bring people and share knowledge. And as we enter this new post-COVID world, we'll have to take it step by step and we will learn and we will change. And as we discover more about COVID, of course, guidance and things like that will change. Being a member of the British Medical Laser Association at this time would be, I think, very beneficial to anybody using laser. And although the name suggests medical, it's an association that's open to anybody using laser, whether you're a beauty therapist, a medical practitioner, nurse or doctor. Um, so if you log onto the website, it's, it's easy to join and it's, it's not very expensive either. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was brilliant. I think everyone would agree that was really informative. Um, I've got a few questions, if you're okay to answer. Um, cool. Okay. So, so someone's asked, does, does all of this and um, plume generation, does this only apply for um, ablative lasers? So, so no, I mean, that, that is a... It is true that traditionally ablative lasers, well, ablative lasers produce more plume, more volume. They are designed 
you know, the treatment itself is a treatment that generates laser bloom. And so traditionally, most people doing ablative treatments are familiar with laser bloom and are, and are aware of the hazards of it and may already have smoke evacuators, for example. But, but what the BMLA is pointing out is that laser bloom isn't just from ablative treatment. You know, laser hair removal produces bloom as well. And so you have to assume that any, any treatment you're doing could, could have the risk of a bloom. So we're suggesting that this guidance covers all laser treatments. All laser and IPL treatments actually should be covered by the same guidance. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, and then someone has asked when you were talking about ventilation, could we direct a fan towards the treatment being carried out with a window open behind? Would that be sufficient? Yeah, f funny enough, um, general advice is to try not to blow stuff around too much because you, it's a bit uncontrollable. Uh, now, if you've got a window open, I guess that's not such a bad idea, but I think general guidance is just open the window. It's probably the best thing to do. Okay. Um, because the danger with fan and turbulence, essentially, is that you can't really control, you're not sure exactly how the particles will, will respond. So uh, my suggestion is just to open the window. Yeah, okay, so don't worry about the fan. Unless you're gonna suck it away, you know, and, and capture it, like a smoke evacuator will, will capture the debris in the filter. And so that's controlled, you've got it captured, you're gonna dispose of it. A fan could blow it all over the place and, and you might not be clear exactly where it's going. So I think just open the window is the best, the best choice. Okay, cool. Um, so as far as you're aware, is there any clear government guidance on using FFP3 masks for doing um, plume generating laser, laser hair removal? Like, is there any, is there any kind of official um, stuff? No, so as far as I'm aware, that the government hasn't produced specific laser related treatment protocols. Yeah. And so I know there's bodies like Safe Face or JCCP, and they have guidance documents, and certainly JCCP guidance document refers to the, B, the British Medical Laser Association's advice. Um, they're the main authority, I think, in yeah. laser treatment and guidance. And that, as far as I'm aware, that's the, the only guidance available at the moment. Yeah, um, and that guidance, I will, I'll pop a link um, in here because we, there's a link to, you can read it on the Aesthetic Medicine website, so I'll pop a link in, in, in a second. Um, so, okay, so what is your view on carrying out facial laser treatment given the current guidelines? And just to kind of um, marry that with another question because someone's actually asked about clients wearing a mask um, and what... Um, yeah, so what kind of mask should the client wear and whether that should be, you know, the same, also N95 or FFP3. So what's your kind of view on facial treatments in general in, in those regards? So the guidance so far for clinics opening um, is to not do any facial treatments at this stage. Uh, I think when you look on the government website, there's a slight caveat to that. because It does say this doesn't apply in a medical setting. Yeah. Uh, so... I think there's some ambiguity there. I can say that in our clinic, we've decided not to do facial treatments until further notice. And I think that's probably the best uh, approach. So at the moment, we will only do treatments on the body, like laser hair removal, for example. We won't be doing stuff on the face. And, and in, in that being the situation, then we're giving our clients uh, just a surgical mask to wear. And in fact, the, the BMLA guidance suggest surgical masks. So that's predominantly to protect you as an operator from a potentially COVID positive patient. So there is an assumption here that as an operator, you're, you're not COVID positive. Mm. And so all these guidance documents make a bit of an assumption that you're protecting yourself and your workforce from a potentially positive patient or client coming in. So they just get a, a surgical mask. I don't think there's anything wrong, though, with offering a patient an FFP2 or potentially FFP3. I don't think you need to mask, but of course they won't have been fit tested for it. So it might not be as effective to do, to do that. Mm. Um, but a surgical mask is what rec is recommended. The FFP2 and FFP3 are just for the practitioner. 
Okay. And then I guess we run into other sort of difficulties when, when um, we are allowed to do facial treatments, you know, if you were doing like laser hair removal on the upper lip or something, well then of course the client can't wear a mask anyway. And that's why we suggest you've got to upgrade to the FFP3 when you're doing all treatments above the neck, mm. because that, you know, you likely when we can do facial treatments to be removing that, that uh, the surgical mask from the client and that's going to then add an, a bigger element of risk yeah. to you as a practitioner. So you upgrade your mask yeah. to, to be appropriate. Yeah. I chatted to a friend actually just over the weekend. He's an A&E consultant uh, in a hospital. And obviously he's gone through the whole COVID thing. And they did, um, in the hospital, they've tested all their staff for, uh, to see if they've got COVID antibodies, see who's had COVID. Mm. And he said to me, you know, the department with the least cases of COVID infection in the, in the staff was the uh, intensive care unit. Mm. And this is the unit that's, that's intubating people, you know, putting pipes down people's throats who are, who are COVID positive patients. And he said it's the effectiveness of good PPE. Yeah. You know, wearing visors, FFP3 masks, properly fit tested, gowns. The PPE really does work. So yeah. if we wear a visor and an FFP3 mask. That, that's the same sort of standard of protection that people have been using in intensive care units during the COVID crisis. I'm quite sure that it's, you know, you could not be accused of underplaying it. I mean, it's the safest way to be. Yeah. In place. Yeah, definitely. Um, so someone's asked, where can we buy the ULPA filters? It's a good question. I mean, we, we got, we have the machine for the sort of smoke evacuator. We have uh, the, we sell that smoke evacuator and it comes automatically with you uh, ultra low particulate air filters anyway. In um, air purification devices, it's a good question. I've not looked into that. I guess you just have to go online. But when you're looking for the device, just make sure it has an option for that sort of filtration in it. Okay. Um... And someone's kind of similarly asked, is an air conditioning unit not advised? No, they're okay air conditioning units. I mean, so it is a bit controversial. I've heard uh, people say in offices, turning off air conditioning for the reason I mentioned before, that it blows particles around the room and it's not uh, clear where they're, they're going. But I think in treatment rooms, it's you know, air conditioning is quite critical to patients, keeping cool, you know, lasers kick out a lot of heat anyway. And I think the main thing there is, I know on some air conditioning units, you can certainly circulate air. So, yeah. so that's what you shouldn't do. What you need to do is extract the air from the room, try and pump it to the outside if possible. So that's the main thing with the air conditioning units. Yeah, that makes sense. Are you all right for time, John? Because we're having loads of questions coming through. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so, and then when you were talking about um, maintaining and sort of cleaning your equipment, someone's asked if Clinel wipes are okay for the laser and blocks. That's a really good point, yeah. So, so Clinel wipes aren't, up, I don't think they're alcohol-based wipes, they're a chemical disinfectant, uh, but I understand that they're, they are good for COVID or good for virus, and in fact we have some Clinel wipes ourselves, so yes, I think they're, they're fine. I mean, you should check. Obviously, I don't know what laser that is or what manufacturer it is, but certainly check with the manufacturer themselves. But with anyone with Linton systems, we, we say they were, the nail wipes were good. Okay, cool. Um, is there a maximum time that we can treat for in one session on one person? What would you recommend? Really good question. So there's no definition of a time. We don't stipulate an actual time in the BMOA guidance. But uh, I know that we're saying up to an hour, and we're going to take that because that's also the same guidance that Health and Safety Executive advised for wearing an FFP3 or FFP2 respirator. So they suggest not longer than an hour's continuous use. So we're going to limit our treatment times to an hour. Uh, and I think that way it gives the practitioner a break. It limits the amount of uh, plume that's created, of course, and it allows you then to you know, open up the room, let it vent, uh, and, and ready for the next client to come in. Yeah, okay, so about an hour. About an hour. Great.
Um, um, oh, someone just saying, thank you so much. It's been really beneficial. She's not one of Linton's clients, but just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, you are welcome, Christy. Thank you for joining us. Um, okay, so are there any reusable FFP3 and FFP2 masks available to purchase that you would recommend? Are they kind of, is it a kind of manufacturer brand type specific thing or are they kind of all the same? Good question. So I don't know about reusable FFP2 or FFP3 respirators. So I can't recommend any specifically. Um, ones that we've been finding are disposable ones. I know that they um, I think they have, uh, uh, if there's an NR on the mask, that stands for not reusable. So oh, if okay. If there's an NR on the mask anywhere, then you shouldn't reuse it at all. Interesting. If, if not, then I think they can be reused. Uh, but, but obviously, you have to assume after the treatments that it could have been contaminated. So if you're taking it on and off, you must be very careful. Mm. Uh, the, there is some guidance that says you can... If you, if you were very careful, you could take some of the masks off and you could put them in a Ziploc bag, label them up and wait 72 hours because that would then make sure any COVID contamination uh, was no longer viable, so no, no longer a threat. And you could probably reuse them that way and almost have a few masks recycled down. We, yeah. We're not going to do that because of the risk of getting confused or mixed up or you know not quite getting that right. So I guess some of these disposable masks or respirators um, should could be used in that sense but I think only if they don't contain NR if there's an NR symbol then they're single use only okay that's good to know I didn't know that that, that, yeah. that. I mean I check with the manufacturer in all these cases read the instructions um, yeah because obviously they're more expertise in I have in this yeah okay great um da -da 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 -da. Um, mm, mm, mm. Okay, so someone has said, so thank you for the template risk ass assessment, which uh, they use in clinic. So she says, one way I wanted to get back into using my Linton XL light was to start with very few short treatments um, using FFP3 and plenty of gel. She said, I guess I would need plume extraction at some point, but do you agree that that's reasonable? Absolutely reasonable. If you're putting gel on the skin and you've got the, uh, I know that product, so that's got a, a, a light guide tip that's going to press onto the gel. Any plumes likely to be trapped in the gel won't trap everything, but for the amount that would then escape, if you're wearing the correct PPE, I think that's absolutely fine. Okay, perfect. Very sensible. Cool. Um... So someone says that they, they use um, gel with laser diode, but sometimes can smell burn, burning, smell burnt hair. Is that just kind of a... Well, I, I guess, I mean, that's true of IPL as well, I think. Um, anytime you smell the burning hair, you've clearly got some sort of airborne particles that you can, you know, that's why you can smell it, of course. Mm. And I think no matter how much gel and, and uh, trying to trap it in the, in, in the gel itself, there will always be a small amount that could escape. So if you can smell burning hair, you could try a thicker layer of gel potentially, but uh, you know, a mask of course is the way to stop that really. If you're wearing the FFP two or three masks, then you protect yourself. Yeah, cool, okay. Um... Okay, so someone said, uh, you mentioned laser plume can contain uh, HIV and HPV. Um, so this person says, I don't think if inhaled it can cause a problem. They're basically asking if it can affect the skin. So does that essentially mean that you could catch, for example, viral warts from plume? So, so yeah, there is evidence of that actually. So that, that can be the case. Probably more so in, <clears throat> there's definitely evidence in surgical lasers of that occurring. I think the big thing where we relate this to COVID is the fact that COVID is a respiratory tract yeah. virus. So you, if you're breathing that in, you're breathing it into the exact spot where it's going to infect you. Yeah. So I think that's the, the issue 
which we know with COVID. And we're, and we're sort of trying to link this all together because there's not enough evidence for this, you know. We don't have evidence that COVID is transmitted in laser blue. Yeah. But we assume that it could be. Yeah. Because we know that uh, HPV is, for example, or can, can be. So <clears throat> we're just linking two things together and saying, to, if we want to be absolutely safe, in the absence of further evidence, this is the way we should handle the situation. Yeah, and you know, and this is also um, a kind of argument for COVID or no COVID, why plume, I guess, we, like we were saying earlier, that needs to be kind of taken seriously as a, um, a considerable kind of, I guess, occupational hazard when you're doing laser treatments anyway, yeah. all those other things that it could carry. Yeah. I think that's a great point you raise there. I mean, there has been research done only in the last couple of years, just that saying that you know, laser plume could be hazardous to health anyhow. This is before COVID, you know, because it's like breathing in dust particles constantly isn't good for us. So I think even beyond COVID, we'll see people taking laser plume more seriously as a, as a hazard in laser yeah. treatments and just looking at ways to, to reduce <clears throat> the, the, uh, the risk, you know, smoke evacuators will become more common, I think, you know. But, but at this point, COVID is the, the main, you know, driving force for, for doing all of this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so someone's asked, if, if we don't have a window or evacuation filters, would using ultrasound gel uh, be enough on its own to prevent plume? I think it's really good. Yeah, the ultrasound gel... Um, Provided you've got a contact laser as well, I think the evidence that's been shown has gel with contact on top of it. If there's just gel with nothing on top of it, it's more likely that the particles would escape. But, but I do think gel helps no matter what. Yeah. So if you're using a contact device like an IPL or a laser that's got a sapphire tip, I think gel and contact is brilliant. It really minimizes plume. You can't say it gets rid of everything, but it really min minimizes it. If you have gel, but you're just using a more traditional laser, I still think it's, it's beneficial, but I'd be also looking at perhaps using a smoke evacuator with that as well. Mm -hmm. But, but in, in both those cases, I mean, I do realize there are, there are treatment rooms that, that will have limited options to vent after treatment. Yeah. And so you, those are sort of treat, treatment rooms where you should be looking more at using you know, using gel contact methods or, or smoke evacuators. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, mm, 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 let's see. Okay. So someone says, um, I've got a diode cooling tip. How long do you recommend in between, um, or how long do you recommend to leave in between each patient using that, that cooling tip? So I assume that's a contact method as well. So that means the airborne particles will be less than normal. Um, there is no good recommendation because I don't know the size or shape of the room, what ventilation there is. But I, but I can say that at our clinic, we're trying to leave a half hour gap between treatments just to allow ventilation to take place. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so when carrying out laser hair removal, we use Cryo 6 to cool the skin. What's your advice on this, please? Good point. So the BMLA recommend, if possible, trying to avoid using the cryo devices for the time being um, because they blow cold air onto the skin to keep the skin cool. And I go back to the point with the fan before that you then can blow debris around the room and it's uncertain uh, then where it's going to end up. However, I think, I mean, I was chatting to Michelle about this. You have to weigh up risk in this situation because the cryo 6 is a very effective uh, skin protection method for laser treatments. And if the risk of not using it could lead to you damaging someone's skin because you weren't cooling properly, then I would suggest that that outweighs the risk of blowing potentially contaminated laser plume around the room, because that's a very small risk already, in my opinion. So I think you have to use your judgment, really. If you can avoid using the cryo 6, use a cool pack, use cold gel, then that's fine probably better but if your clients can't tolerate the treatments or there's a risk then I would uh, use the cryos but I would recommend using them on the lowest blowing setting which is setting one so that doesn't blow very hard it's a more gentle setting I think you should just use them on the lowest setting you can okay 
tab. Um, yeah, so someone just asking again about what kind of, um, actually two people, what kind of mask the client should wear. So um, someone's also talking about face, Oh no, sorry, these are two different questions. Yeah, so what kind of master client should wear, um, which we, we've touched surgical. on anyway. We, we recommend surgical masks. Yeah, yeah, so they don't need to um, be the same as the practitioners. Um, and then someone said, are there any particular types of face shields to be worn while doing loads of hair removal? So I'm not sure whether this person perhaps is talking more about visors than that. Visors. Yeah, we've just got some reusable visors that we just wipe down treatments. Um, I don't even know what brand they are, but, but no, there's no particularly, I think, you know, a visor, it's a, it's a physical barrier. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be super strong. I think yeah. the ones are fine, just wipe them down. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, can I just, one thing with visors would be to make sure you've got your laser goggles are comfortable underneath them. That's one thing that you would need to check. Yeah, okay. Um, and just on that, someone said um, PP3, they're, they're finding PP3 very hard to get hold of. Um, so where's Linton? So where, where are you guys getting yours from? Good question. So we obviously have a supplies department when we're buying our laser bits. So they're getting them in for us. Um, I think on our website, we might post some suppliers. And if not, certainly in our Facebook forum, I think we'll put some suppliers in there. Um, okay. But I think if you go online, that there are suppliers. It's true that... I think um, a few weeks or months ago, they were really difficult to come by. Yeah. Arguably, arguably as well, uh, you know, a lot of them were being directed, rightfully so, to the NHS themselves. Whereas now I've noticed in recent weeks, there seems to be more, more suppliers. So um, they, they shouldn't be as difficult to get hold of, I guess. And I think if you go to our website or go to our Facebook page, there's people posting where they're getting their, their FFP3s from. Oh, okay, cool. That's helpful. Um, okay, so should I be using gloves while doing my laser hair removal or is it okay just to wash my hands between clients? So we would recommend gloves, of course, with all laser treatments, uh, and, but certainly wash hands as well. In fact, yeah. um, when you take on and off, or off your PPE, so your gloves or your visor or your, or your mask, before you do that, you should wash your hands and then, of course, afterwards, you, you should wash your hands again, just to avoid contamination, especially when you're removing the, the respirators because you're going right near to your mouth. So regular hand washing, no matter what. But yes, I would recommend gloves uh, with all laser treatments. Yeah. Um, okay. A few more, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so someone, we touched on this earlier, but someone else has just asked, um, should clinics avoid using forced air cooling devices and use other me methods of cooling instead? Um, and let's see. Okay, so what is the impact of uh, laser plume with a pregnant therapist? So should she avoid working during her pregnancy? It's a good question. I mean, I think you have to do a risk assessment, obviously. Um, my view on laser plume anyway is that it can be a hazard. So I would be asking any therapist to wear masks anyway, whether it's COVID related or not. And in this case, I would certainly be insistent on it with a pregnant therapist. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see why there would be any additional harm, but it might be a better choice to say uh, not to do, you know, laser treatments during that time. It's a bit like treating pregnant people. There's no good evidence that you would cause any harm during a laser treatment to someone who's pregnant, but nobody does because we don't want to take any risks. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. Okay, so on the subject of fans, if the room has an extractor fan to the outside, um, this person saying, my understanding is to only turn it on between patients with the door and window open, um, with the fan on and out, is that correct? And I guess it's kind of like what, we, what you were saying earlier about it's best not to have the fan actually kind of pointing out the treatment whilst it's happening. Yeah, I think, I think an extraction fan is okay. Um, yeah. I understand the point of 
opening the door. So obviously in a laser dream, you can't open the door. So join the dream in the door and window should be, should be shut, of course. Yeah. And, uh, if you've got a window, blind should be down for laser safety. I don't see why you couldn't extract the air during the treatment, but the, the reason to open the windows and doors and then use your extractor is you get a better air flow through, so it's more effective. Mm. So absolutely between treatments, open the door windows and get that extractor running for yeah. sure. But I don't see any harm in having an extraction fan, you know, I assume it's like a ceiling mounted vent, just pulling air out whilst you're doing the treatment. I don't see that that's an issue. Okay. Um, but, um, but certainly the correct, it's more effective to open the door and windows. Okay, cool. Um, uh, so would you recommend using an FFP2 still, uh, given evidence of what's contained in plume? Like, do you think that's still um, kind of worth using? Yeah, I, I, I do because I think, um, so if you're just talking about plume in general, and the risks associated with, you know, the particles and plume. I'll go back to the point that the health and safety said at the time, you know, we're not saying that one or two particles of burnt hair being breathed in is going to cause you a lot of damage. It's, it's a cumulative over time. It's the, it's the volume that you have. So an FFP2 mask is perfectly fine for laser cleaning full stop. The only reason to upgrade to FFP3 is if the, is specifically really the risk from COVID, and, and when the risk is higher, it's going to be around the face, around the mouth area for the, for the client. So that's the only reason I see that you'd need the FFP3. I think FFP2 is absolutely fine for all of the treatments. Okay, cool. Um, mm, mm, mm. Should we use FFP3 when treating the body with CO2, considering the increased amount of smoke? No, I don't think you, you need to. Uh, I go back to the point before that FFP2 is still 95% effective and a small amount of particles, full stop, um, would be, you know, if you're breathing a small amount of burnt skin particles, I don't think there'll be a huge risk to you. Uh, I think the main thing there is just limiting how much you do breathe in. So an FFP2, is going to limit that to 95%. It, it's when we come to COVID again, if, we, if you thought the body was contaminated, of course, with COVID, then you would, you would probably use FFP3, but it's, it's, like, it's, it, it's unlikely, it's mostly likely on the face and neck to be contaminated through sort of touch or smearing, you know, droplets onto the skin. So, so I'd only go for FFP3 for COVID related issues around the neck and face. I think FFP2 is fine otherwise. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this is interesting. So someone's asked, are facial, are facial laser hair removal treatments allowed for transgender people being more medical reason for treatment? So this is probably one, um, probably not really something that you could advise on, is it John? It being a medical it's, treatment. It, it, yeah, in all honesty, um, that's, I think it's ambiguous and I couldn't, I think yeah. it, clinics have to make those decisions, unfortunately, for themselves. I would say that at this stage, we, our clinic wouldn't do that for now until government guidance changed. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't say uh, that, you know, it's not possible. It's just, I think that's down to an, an individual clinic to decide. Yeah, or perhaps it might be worth getting in touch with any, um, any like, uh, associations you might be a member of um, or perhaps your right. local council guidelines there's probably there is probably an answer you can get to um, it's just finding the right person to give you that answer really um, because as you say it, it is a medical treatment and we know that medical treatments have been allowed to continue um, in you know aesthetics but for medical rather than cosmetic reasons um, so yes yeah, sir we can't really give much advice on that one um, Okay, so someone's asked, is 15 minutes okay in between clients? Um, but John just said you would advise um, half an hour between clients, wouldn't you? Yeah, I th well, I think the truth is it depends on, on the room, what sort of ventilation you've got. And so it's hard to say an actual time because it just depends on that circumstance. So we've chosen half an hour 
We've got a standard treatment room, doesn't have windows, does have vents, so half an hour. But, you know, if you've got a good treatment room with windows and you can vent it quickly, then I don't see why it couldn't be faster. Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, another question just about recommending good um, P2 and P3 masks, but, I mean, you kind of said you can just, there's not a particular brand or manufacturer, is there, that is good and better than others? Just, just look for medical, medical CE, I think, is what most people are going for at the moment, but other than that, I, I don't have a particular brand. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so someone's asked, how is it physically possible to do a treatment with, um, okay, so if this person wears reading glasses, so with reading glasses, goggles, a mask, and visors. Um, very, very difficult. I mean, I yeah. think the best thing you can do, obviously I wear glasses and, and so do some of our practitioners, and you can see I had to put the goggles or glasses on over the top. Mm. Uh, I think all you can do is, as I said earlier, practice first. You, you know, put on the PPE, put everything on, try and find, you know, if it doesn't work for you, try, try alternatives. Uh, that's all I can recommend at the moment. It's, it's not easy. I mean, our practitioners said at first it's really awkward for them, yeah. but there is no real good solution to that, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, exactly. It's got to be done, hasn't it? Um, okay. Okay, so when using a gel, um, if the plume is mainly captured by the gel, is there any advice on disposing of the gel? That's a really good point, yes. I should have mentioned that, I suppose. You know, Potentially, that's a clinical waste now because it's captured, uh, could have captured COVID positive plume, I suppose. So, we would suggest scraping it off and disposing of it like you would with normal clinical waste. So, I assume you've got a clinical waste bin. So, just make sure it's, it's going in there. Certainly, don't. Occasionally, I see therapists move it around to sort of essentially reuse the gel a bit. Uh, you mustn't do that. I mean, you shouldn't do that anyway. But uh, you, you just go scrape it off into a disposable container into clinical waste. Okie dokie. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. I hadn't thought about that. Um, oh, so someone's just said, um, for everyone asking about getting hold of um, masks, Medisave apparently have um, P2 and 3. So that's helpful. Thank you for that, Christy. Um, thank you so much. Really helpful. You're welcome. Um, so someone said they bought a Dyson air purifier. Is this okay as they don't have the possibility of an extraction fan? Uh, good question. I don't know, unfortunately. I don't know enough about them. I think they're the ones that have just got a hoop handling. They just, I don't know how they, I don't know how they purify yeah. them. So I'm not sure. I wonder whether perhaps Dyson would be able to give the best advice on that. Better, better choice, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Fab, I think we just have a few more on here and then I will let you go. And what are your thoughts on fogging between clients? So is this the device that sort of fills the room with like a disinfectant vapour? I'm guessing, this was a question from Facebook, but I'm guessing that's what this person means. Yeah. So I've, I've heard about this. I don't have any direct experience. I think from what we've read, it looks okay. And my only hesitation, uh, because I was asked about this by one of our team, actually. I think for the room itself and the environment, it's pro well, it sounds like it's a good option. My, my hesitation is the lasers themselves. So most lasers have optics inside them and they're not sealed up. Uh, airtight units. So if you were to fill the air with um, with a disinfectant vapour, which essentially is, is what happens, and it settles on surfaces and disinfects them. Uh, I'd like to know if it was if it was settling on the lenses and the mirrors and the optics inside the laser itself. It's highly likely to cause some damage to those optics. So my feeling was initially it's probably a good method for general treatment rooms but take your laser out before you, you do it. Okay. But, but, but I don't have any evidence, you know, I've not tried it, so it's just my immediate thoughts. Okay, fab, thank you. And okay, just finally, someone has asked, um, so yeah, so would you say it's not enough to be wearing a surgical mask as a therapist doing laser hair removal? I mean, you 
no, you need to be wearing a, um, a proper one. Yeah. 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 Um, and then they do, a, this person does a full body, which takes two hours. And again, so John early just recommended that you maximum an hour for a, for a treatment at the moment. I would break it up. I would do two sittings, you know, whether it be you know, time apart. And no, I think you need to wear a respirator, you know, that, like those disposable masks. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do it, you need to do it properly, don't you? Otherwise, it's kind of no point. Um, Surgical masks don't protect you as an operator. I mean, a lot of people that I, I find I don't understand that, that they're designed to protect the outside world from your breath. Mm. But, but you can breathe anything in through them. So they're not going to give you any protection at all, you know. So, mm. you know. Mm. Good point. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I didn't know we would get so many questions, so that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> and thank you for answering them all. So, yeah, if anyone wants um, any of those, the resources, I mean, that John explained, you don't have to be a Linton customer to get hold of um, the kind of reopening guidelines, and they'll, they'll be on the Linton website. Um, there's also lots of advice that we've um, kind of reshared on aesthetic medicine. Um, the JCCB guidelines can be found on our website as well. Um, and Maybe yeah. British, we can put the British Medical Laser Association guidance on, or at least a link from your website. Yeah, 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 we'll put that up as well. That's a good idea. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll, on Facebook, underneath this stream, I'll put uh, the link for those. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope that found, you found that helpful. And thank you so much, John. That was brilliant. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Um, all right. And good luck, everyone, opening and getting back to treatments as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well done for hanging in there, everyone. All yeah. right. Well, thanks so much, John. No problem, George. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.